Hello, and welcome back to the full ride here on the Chase Thomas Podcast, where I am now joined by my good friend and fellow University of North Georgia alumni, Matt Green, here on the full ride this evening. Matt Green, how are you, sir? Doing well, sir. Doing well. It's good to be back. Uh, good to be back again this week, talking ball. Um, always repping North Georgia. I love it. Always repping North Georgia. That's what we do on this very podcast. Today I'm actually repping USA, so okay. that's um you know, no one can no one can hate on that, right? It's USA. It's it's uh enough said. <laughs> yeah. Dead air. Yeah, I didn't know where you were going with that, but I like it. Fair enough. Um yeah, uh but yeah, it doesn't even look like a USA uh, T-shirt though, because it's got like a gray and black look. It, to it is gray and like navy. It's like the the shield kind of like the mm-hmm. soccer type shirt, you know. Now that you say bring that up, and now I'm thinking about all of your wardrobe choices over the years, Matt, and thinking back to North Georgia, our North Georgia undergrad days, I don't seem to recall you being much of a, a pastel, springy type color guy. I've never seen you in the light colors. You do a lot of dark colors, and then Is the that, Georgia stuff. You might be honest on in there. I don't know. I've never, uh, I've never noticed to be honest. I'm rocking a mango uh, Columbia. Uh, dry fit. I don't have any mango shirts in my collection, but I also like I'm anti orange. Like there's nothing I would wear that's orange unless I'm like showing some spirit for like linear Longhorns. Like my brother was a coach, eighth grade coach at one point there, and then my dad like now he helps out with, like their varsity. Mm-hmm. But um, so that's the only way that burnt orange linear I would rock it. But that's the only orange I'll be caught dead in. Hold on. That doesn't make any sense. You're a Tequila Falcon diehard. Not only are you North Georgia, or North Georgia, well, North Georgia, North Gwinnett, you had a whole run of Norse there for a little bit, but um, <laughs> no, you, you're in Tequila Falcon country. You can't be seen anywhere wearing some Lanier Longhorns in the local Tequila that's, Kroger. You can't do it. That's fair. I think they're like same region or something, but um, mm. that, that's a rivalry. That's actually one of the games I went to is when Lanier actually came to Tequila, but um, you know, Blood, you know, I gotta I gotta rep my pops, you know. So if he's if he's if he's rocking the burnt orange, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. There you go. Because my my dad raised me that way. He had a, <laughs> a he had a shirt. I'm sure a lot of people have have seen these old Georgia Georgia fan shirts. It says Rednecks turn orange in the fall, and then it's got Tennessee, Clemson, Florida, and Auburn on the back of it. So it's how I was raised. Well, I can't really talk considering I have a Waffle House uh, hat with my Tennessee <laughs> stuff. So um, I don't know. Waffle House will be in the top three, top five restaurants for me forever. You got to rip Waffle House whenever you can. This is a very Waffle House friendly podcast. Um, this is also the debut of more art behind me. I don't know if you noticed this, Matt Green, but we've got Peyton. He's made his first appearance on the, the YouTube. So you can check that out on YouTube.com. Chase on this podcast. He's right next to Doc Rivers in a hawk uniform. You know Benjamin Matlock, my guy, my favorite all-time uh, TV character. And then we've got, for my family, my dad's favorite show growing up, guess what? Andy Griffith's show, The Men of Mayberry. This I'm not even going to mention how much this thing cost back in the day when I got this. It took a little bit to get ordered and come in, but uh, it's like metal, and it's uh, it's super cool, but it's like an old set thing. I don't know, but you got Don Knotts, you got Ron Howard, you got Gomer, so... There you go. Uh, I, I brought I brought it all together. It's a very homey uh, setting now behind us. So you got your flags Getting and rude, I got like Jalen Rose uh, vibes there behind you, like on that show. They get Jalen and Jacoby. Mm-hmm. It's kind of what, what you're going for. I, I respect it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, big I got... Andy Griffith guy. I see. Yes. Um, oh, ow. I think I just broke my toe doing this. Um, the Air Force. They sent me a helmet. Okay. So how cool is that? So that's going to go somewhere. Haven't decided. So shout out to the Air Force football program for, for sending that over. But it's a, um, it's a quality face mask, too. That's a, that's a nice helmet you got there. Uh, yes. There is not a great way to do that. So it was in a weird spot. But, yeah, I mean, building out the home office and all that good stuff, I, uh, I want to make the – like, as we expand out on YouTube here and all that good stuff, I want to continue adding – to, to the home office. Um, Matt, anything new with you in the last week? Uh, anything new at home? Anything new with the pups? Having any um, other strange men cutting your grass? Like, anything hey, like that? Bernie. 
<laughs> Birdie, not only that, he stays mowing just the back part of my yard. I mow the rest of it, but mm-hmm. he, um, I'm not going to stop him. You know that uh, that part would take me way longer to do than it takes him on the riding lawn mower. Mm-hmm. But um, earlier today, I see him out picking up pine cones, like. On my side of the yard, like our where yards come together, this guy's mm-hmm. picking up pine cones basically in my yard for me. Like this guy, just Bernie, shout out, <laughs> quality neighbor. Had no idea what we were getting into when we bought this house. Yeah, like a good neighbor, Bernie is there, as they say. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that was pretty good. Well done, well done. Um, speaking of well done. Uh, Matt Green, Nigel the Nighthawk, our guy. He dropped off some news uh, this week for us before we get into the main event. Um, in the main event, we should mention that at the top of this show, it's going to be uh, some betting odds that FanDuel released, that a uh, bunch of games. Like, there's so many early odds here, and I just went through all of them, and I, there were a lot of them that uh, caught me off guard and uh, surprised me. So, we're going to do our five biggest, uh, most interesting uh, early lines. They'll change. Um, I don't think they'll change drastically, uh, barring injuries and stuff like that. But uh, it tells us where people see a lot of these teams uh, going into this fall and what we, what we should expect and those fan bases should expect going into uh, the 2022 season. But before we get there, uh, the Pac-12 is scrapping its divisions uh, starting this year. This is happening now. We talked on the pod last week that the ACC was moving towards this next year. And then uh, the Pac-12 coming out of nowhere and just being like yeah we're gonna go ahead and do this today and it's another good reminder that so much of what we like to believe takes time and uh it's like well it has to go through this process we have to do this so it's like when we learn with scheduling you can schedule the week of the game and make it all work you can do coastal byu that week you that's you don't have to schedule 10 years out you don't have to do any of this there's no that we don't have to keep doing this um, cause you can get it done. And the PAC 12 was like, we're just going to change our model and, uh, do this differently this year. And look, I think this is the way to go. I think divisions have kind of outlived their use. I think in a lot of these conferences, uh, shout out to the ACC and the big 10, we can't even name what they're called half the time and who's where, and there's just no, no reason for it anymore. Um, the SEC is just too big. I, at, I miss at, the legends and leaders. I know the legends and leaders. It's just, it's kind of silly and we don't need to do that anymore. And the model of the two best teams in the year face off in the championship game. Some years they'll have already played in the regular season. Some years they won't. And that's just how it should be. And the folks who are worried, it's like, oh, well, how does the Mizzou's and the Arkansas's and the Mississippi States and the Colorado's, how did they ever get back in? If you're only going to do the the best composite rating, the best conference rating, because that changes things. It changes who represents it. But it's like, well, it'll be better games. And ultimately, the system is better when it rewards the best. And ultimately, that's what we want. We want the best games possible. And even if that means rematches sometimes, those are still the best games because those are the two best teams in the conference championship, which should be the point, right? Yeah, for sure. When, and these these conferences get so big. Like That's why the Big 12 is just doing it well. I, although I guess the Big 12 is going to have to do it differently once mm-hmm. they get the four new teams. But um, they'll, they'll be a 12 team. I, they will be the Big 12 at that point. Yes. So I think it's, um yeah, I can't hate on the Pac-12 doing it, except for it just seems weird before you, you adjust the scheduling. Because you could just have someone that's, in the bit Pac-12 South that's got a much more difficult schedule or vice versa and two teams from the North make it make it in or something like that you know what I mean so it seems like until you balance out the schedule you kind of have to keep the divisions as is but yeah I mean it makes sense for like the the big picture I think that's that's really going to be the only way to do it like when when the SEC when you're talking about a 16 team conference like you're going to have to just take the two best conference records, which essentially is what best winning percentage is saying. I guess if you get a game canceled, the, the percentage could be different or something, but that's essentially what it's saying. I, I think it seems like an overreaction in terms of like like the, the fan reaction to it because like it's not going to be that many – there's not going to be that many years where it was even really – an option for like usually the team that wins the sec east sec west those are usually like basically the two best teams in the conference like there's Mm -hmm. some exceptions in there and with multiple conferences like 
The Big Ten is definitely one that the Big Ten East seemed much better than the Big Ten West. Seems like those are the two best teams are usually in that division. Um, but it's just, I, I hate that we, we we're just we want to take so much off of the field when it comes to college football. It's like while you might have your opinion on the oh the East is stronger or the West is stronger, there are those instances where. Like, they're, they may be rare, but there's instances where there's a lot of good teams that can kind of beat each other up, and then the team that comes out of that division is actually a lot better than you think they are. Like, that sort of thing can happen a lot. And so it's, like, to have these, these lopsided, say if it's in the Big Ten or something, to have these lopsided conferences or divisions, and Wisconsin could could win that, and, they, and you just decide to play Ohio State-Michigan part two because oh, they're the best two teams. Like, Wisconsin, you didn't play anybody, whatever – whatever your opinion is, it seems like a slippery slope. Like while you can do the divisions, it seems like you're playing all these teams. Whoever comes on top should be in the conference championship. Yeah. I mean, you could sell me on just not doing the conference championship games anyway, but um, I don't know. I think we're just going to see more shuffling a uh, friend of the pod, late kicks, uh, Josh Pate. He mentioned this. Um, I think I was uh, listening to this today where he talked about um, one of the pros, because he's pretty anti-college uh, football playoff expansion, like myself, and he, the one positive of expansion is that, like, you're going to see more teams scheduling out of conference, better out-of-conference schedules, because they're not as concerned about dropping uh, an out-of-conference game early in the season to a good team, another Power 5 team. So we're going to see more home-and-homes versus uh, what we the travesty we just saw take place on the Tennessee football Twitter timeline uh, this week with Tennessee dropping the Provo trip uh, for the Cougs uh, to play in Nashville uh, against uh, Tony Elliott's Virginia Cavaliers, which we'll get to in a second. But I don't know. I just think it's uh, it's more change, man. It's, it's pretty wild. A lot of change is happening, and we have to keep an eye on that bill that's circulating uh, in California. You and I are not legal scholars, so I'm not going to pretend to have like a strong take on the matter. Um, but there's a good piece by Zach Barnett in Football Scoop that folks can go check out if they want to learn more about what's going on, uh, especially ahead of Thursday's decision and what's going to happen there. But I don't know. I think I, I, it's kind of funny that I've gotten kind of conditioned to the daily, just like, what's college football going to do today? I'm, I'm hesitant to like even put together our show sheet because I'm like, I feel like there's going to be nine other things the sport decides to do tomorrow that's going to throw everything up in the air, right? Oh yeah, seriously. But I had another. It's like stayed on this topic with mm. Pac-12 scheduling. I'm I'm not exactly aware of the Pac-12 as much as I'm the SEC. Like I'll admit that when the SEC was at the 12 team, a 12 team conference, they would always play six games against their division, or mm. five games, I should say, against their division and then three games from the other division. Right now, the Pac-12 is playing a nine-game conference schedule, right? Mm. So they're playing four teams from the other division. Mm. And are none of those locked, are any of those like locked rivals like they have in the in the SEC, are you aware? Or are we just seeing four, kind of a rotation of four teams? Like you get six teams in probably every four, four years or so. They might play everybody home and home, I would think. I'm really so, not sure off the top of my head. I'm not 100% ahead. sure how they have the scheduling set up, but if if you are one of those teams that maybe avoids some of the better teams in the in the Pac-12 North or something this year, say I don't I haven't I don't have USC and like Utah schedule right in front of me, but mm. if they did avoid the better teams in the Pac-12 North and then they both end up having records in the best team in the Pac-12 North just based on the schedule and who they played, it just wouldn't seem right for both of them to get into the conference championship. And I honestly think the the rematch is almost would go against somebody. Mm. Like last year, if we're in 2020 or something, if we're going, although granted, I don't think A&M and Florida were tied, but hypothetically, if they were, bad example, I guess, because A&M beat Florida. But mm-hmm. say Georgia and A&M were tied and they didn't play. If A&M has a loss to Alabama, and Georgia has yet to play Alabama, and they have the same record, it seems like the the rematch would almost go against that team. It's like, well, we saw you play them. We haven't seen them play them yet. You know? Mm. Like, I don't know. It, it's We don't want to see the same games. Like, we don't mind mm. seeing if they're the best teams, but if there's a, a debate on who the best teams are, like, I don't think anyone would have minded seeing, 
you know, LSU, Alabama part two back in 2019. But Georgia was also a, a 11 and one team ranked like number five or something at that point. It's hard to justify Alabama getting a second shot at LSU, especially since I think Alabama lost to Auburn too the week before. But regardless, it just I don't. And I think the the rematch might almost it's it feels like that might should be the second or third tiebreaker. Like if we're trying to get to it. It's like ah, I don't know who to pick. You guys already played them. Let's let's pick someone else. I mean, my gut is to follow. I, does FCS? They don't do conference championship games, do they? Unless I'm mistaken, I don't think they do. Um, in FCS, they just jump right into the playoff format. And I mean, that's what they do in high school. Is that right? Uh, yeah, high school. You win okay. your region, and then you go into the tournament. Like you go into the playoffs. Like you just move on. You're like, yeah, winning your region's cool, and uh, it's a big deal for a lot of programs. But ultimately you, you jump into the playoff pool and you move forward i think it's just kind of silly that we do the conference championship games i would rather if we expand the playoff i would get rid of them i would see, just no, have an... see how oh man we're already i feel like the worst part about college football compared to college basketball is there's such a, a limited way to measure like tangible success mm-hmm. and i feel like conference championships so you can have all these comp all these you know smack talk like oh well you guys you, you guys haven't won anything it's like well we win 80% of our games, right? Like that's, we're a good team. We haven't won a championship, but you still have a conference championship. You still want those, those accolades, like those achievements. Like if you, if you get rid of conference championships, then literally the entire sport, all we care about is the playoff and every game that's not a playoff implications is, is like an irrelevant game. But that's where they're inching towards anyway. That's what they want. Just give them what they want. Let's just stop the Stop no, the charade. That's not what we want. That's not what we want. Some people might want that. It's not we, what I need, want. You need I just, conference championships. Well, here's my other at. Here's what I'll also throw. Um, and it kind of speaks to what you're saying about the body blow thing. Um, if we expand the playoff and then you have the top two best teams in the SEC, what, the scenario, what we're going to see, and this is something that I think if every program's honest about it, it's just depth is going to be the champion year over year from now on. Like, there's no path to you contending seriously. There was already a shallow pool of realistic contenders uh, in the 14 playoff or even in the BCS era. But if you do best team, like, it was a break for Auburn to get Mizzou in the SEC title game. And sometimes you well, need those. Well, but remember, Missouri, I think they lost to, like, Toledo or someone mm-hmm. early in the year, right? But they were, like, ranked number five, number four going to the SEC championship. Like, they were a really good team that year. They they weren't as good as Alabama. But, right. Or <laughs> but, That's what yeah. I'm saying. They weren't as good as, like, several other SEC West teams that year. And my that's theory fair. is that, like, we'll see – it's just going to be hard. So if you're asking an SEC program to run the gauntlet in the SEC, a 16-team SEC with Oklahoma and Texas in it, then play the best team – at the second-best team in your conference – beat them two, and then win three consecutive power five games, basically. And all some of them at home, maybe in neutral site. The only rosters that can handle that kind of wear and tear and that much of a grind are going to be the best of the best, the deepest of the deep. It's just going to be extremely difficult to ask a lot of these programs to go on that kind of run. I, I think when you hear like folks like Saban talk about parity, um, and people just jump on him for anything that he's saying. But, like, ultimately, I get where he's coming from, and I think a lot of fans would prefer that. But the expansion of college football playoff is going to have the inverse effect there, where I just I don't think when you switch to this model, you do the pods, you do more in-conference games if you're an SEC program. So you have nine SEC games plus the SEC title game plus three playoff games. I just – you're Mississippi State, you're Arkansas, you're whoever. You're a good program, you're an old Miss – you have a great year. You can finish number two in the SEC one year. Guess what? You get through and you're still in the playoff. And then you're like, all right, we went 10 and two this year. We won an upset against George in the SEC title game. What's our treat? Penn State on a neutral site. And then uh, another SEC team in round two. And then the national title against like Ohio State or something. Like it's just, hey, that's asking a lot. It. Somebody has to win it, but it will just be a select few. It will be a very, very small number. And I guess that's kind of how it's always been, but I think it will. I think it will grow even smaller, and I kind of will bet on who wins it every year based on who I think is the deepest team in college football that can withstand the most injuries. Yeah, but I mean, that's already kind of 
True. part of who wins it every year, right? I mean, it's like co- college football has always been a, a top-heavy sport. I um, I just wonder how they're going to do the tiebreakers because, like, in the SEC, like, for example, like 2000, 2003, uh, SEC East, Georgia, Tennessee, and Florida – all I think lost one or two. One they lost the same number of conference games and all beat each other essentially. Lost to the other one, and I think they went by the BCS standings. Same way with with Texas A and M or Texas Tech, uh, Oklahoma and Texas in what 2009, 2008, mm-hmm. uh, when all of them were so good. I think they went by the BCS standings, which which kind of sucked because it's like well we all beat each other and the the stand the the rankings are basically going to be based on the preseason rankings, right? That's mm. that's who's going to be at the top. So you can't really go college football ranking in that scenario because there's people, like there's a committee like picking the college football playoff. Like, it doesn't seem as pure as like, oh, let's let the computers decide kind of who amongst these three teams is the best since they all beat each other. It's like we're letting a committee decide. Like, I don't know. It's, it, it's like we're not... They, there's while everyone else is looking at the top four or something, they're they're getting shifty with this number seven and eight and nine or something to determine uh, conference divisions and things like that. I don't know. It would just I'm I'm curious to how they're gonna do it. We where they're gonna have to do something uh, when it comes to these these new bigger conferences. But uh, I don't know. It'll it'll be interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Um... Dan Mullins, next coaching job. Uh, he, friend of the pod, Graham Coffey, broke this one uh, earlier. Was it this week? I don't know. Time. I've been like in a black hole just doing my uh, graduate school finals here at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And uh, I've just been like in a bunker and living in the library and just uh, barely uh, getting little scraps like Oliver Twist. Just like, can I have some college football news, please? And just a, just a little bit. Just I a little bit. More. Yeah, that's me. Um, but you know, I thought, uh, this was pretty interesting and folks, again, people just have their narratives and have their opinions on Dan Mullen. They're like, Oh, how the mighty have fallen from Florida sec power five head coaching job to analyst or whatever his position is going to be assistant, I think, or some kind of helper now at uh, Lake Oconee Academy. I think his son plays there. And my response was, it's a pretty good gig. He gets the buyout money. He gets to li- he already lives in the lake. He gets to spend time with his family these next couple of years. He gets to have a stress-free job and he can just become an Alabama analyst whenever he wants. Like there's no reason for him to jump right back into it. Enjoy your life, man. College football is this... a mess right now. I would I would sit this out for a little bit. I would just be like, let NIL and the transfer portal continue to figure itself out and I'm just going to enjoy lake life, uh, run some fun offenses, spend time with my family and uh, ride my jet ski. I, I salute Dan Mullen for, for this strategy this fall. That's all fair for sure. I, Mm. um, I kind of thought the same thing when I saw people talking shit about him. It's like, we all love to talk shit about Dan Mullen, but yeah, literally this guy is going to be living on his, what living in his $2 million house on Lake Oconee. And right when I heard this story too, I was like, there's no way he's going to be the offensive coordinator. He's mm-hmm. just going to be like some guy that's like helping out with the team, like unofficial title or whatever. He's just, mm-hmm. I'm sure he's just going to provide insight wherever he can. Like, it's probably Florida, you have Florida to like a staff offensive employee. coordinator. Yeah, like he, Florida's like offensive coordinator. That means we don't have to pay. We don't have to pay mm-hmm. him anymore, right? It's like no, no, no official job. I'm not taking a salary. Yeah, I still want your money. I think he'd be an employee of the school. I think to be like a coordinator, I could be wrong, but for that kind of positional coach, I feel like you would have to be teaching something at Lake Oconee or some kind of employee status, but I could be wrong. And it's, um, I mean, yeah, it should be the actual offensive coordinator. I would think yeah. so, but it, it's got to, it is crazy though. Like one year ago today, mm-hmm. there was a lot of people that thought Dan Mullen was a better head coach than Kirby smart. Like that's, that's pretty wild. Now it's like, I would say the vast majority of people think Kirby Smart's the second best coach in college football, and then Dan Mullins at Lake Oconee. <laughs> it's it's crazy. Uh, I don't the turn tables have turned. I just feel like the better argument or the more interesting one to me is that like, do you think this coach with the resources available to him could win a national title? Like, is he good enough to lead a national title? Is he good enough to be a CEO coach that um, if he gets his staff picked off? 
that he can be fine and reassemble a new staff behind them and keep a uh, keep mission. I don't. <sighs> Is that who you're asking about? No, I'm just asking. Like when we're talking about Kirby, when you had him at number two and in, uh, in the country is uh, in terms of just college football coaches. I mean, I don't have a list in front of me, and I don't really do that kind of stuff. But I also just think that like Kirby's clearly one of the elite ones where he's just in the con like you just want to have a coach who's in that conversation where it's like if you have to debate it and there's a case for whatever then you're you're good that means you're in good shape it's the you want the coach that you know you can win a national title with and there are a couple of them and they're the what the what ifs that josh and i uh differed on and i know you differed on my perspective on what makes a like, coach elite but like i i don't know i i think um it's silly to argue about like oh who's better kirby or Mon? it's like kirby's elite he can, you can, he just won a national title. You can win a national title. He's going to keep this thing humming. But Dan Mullen also got Mississippi State number one in the country. Like there is something to be said about just getting Starkville to November that November national championship. I man, <laughs> I'm telling you, he coached. He was a great OC with Urban. Like he, no, he definitely was. No one would ever hate on Dan Mullen's, you know, coaching off offensive coaching ability. Yeah. Right. It's just, it's like I wonder, like. Like Dak Prescott, like does does he get credit for Dak Prescott, or was it more like you know found a diamond in the rough with Dak Prescott? You know, I would argue, I would argue Kyle Trask having Kyle Trask in the Heisman race, who does not appear to be an NFL quarterback, is is mm-hmm. way more be- is a way better coaching job than just kind of discovering this diamond in the rough, Dak Prescott. You know what I mean? Like mm. he's an he's an NFL talent. Like getting having a good offense with Nick Fitzgerald, a super limited quarterback like that that's a better coaching job than than discovering Dak Prescott you know it's like I feel like that the Dak Prescott one is always the one that seems to get highlighted Mm. but um I think it's kind of a Will Muschamp scenario you know it's Mm. like if you can't if you can't win at a place like Florida then you probably can't you're you're probably just a really good uh coordinator and and that's that's probably your ceiling yeah it's Florida like it's not like just the best of the best but it's damn close to the best, right? Florida's up there in that conversation. There's nothing holding you back at a place like Florida. And with the SEC East in general, like, I mean, we all talk about how down the East has been in recent years, like outside of Georgia and basically Florida, like there's not as much competition to like, that's also to an an advantage of the Florida job at this point. So them, him not being able to get it done at Florida, it's hard to justify him ever being a head coach again, just because like, it seemed like such a, like, at a core, people just, like, dislike who, him as a person. It's like, that, that's, that seems really important. Like, if you just want to scheme some offense up and just be the, the coordinator or something, that seems like somewhere he can go find a fit and finish out his career. If that's what he wants to do, or he can just hang out with his money on Lake Oconee. But I, it's hard to see him ever getting a legitimate, like, big-time college football job, again, in my opinion. Like, I could see him... At a, at a smaller level, like where Jim McElwain is right now, like where is he? Colorado State, uh, Central or Michigan, Central Michigan. It's Colorado State is where he started. Yeah, mm. somewhere like that, maybe where it's, you know, it's you don't necessarily have to have the elite of the elite talent to to win those conferences. It can be maybe more about what you can do as a coach. I could see him resurfacing somewhere like that, but it's hard to see him get another another big time Power Five job. I mean, if I was Mullen, I would just wait for the right OC job in the NFL. I think he would just be an elite offensive coordinator. Like, Matt Canada is doing that right now with the Steelers. Like, he's the Steelers OC, and we know Matt Canada during his brief tenure at Maryland and was the OC at LSU, and um, he's bounced around, had a lot of OC jobs. But, I mean, Joe Brady goes to the NFL with the Panthers as OC, and he got let go, and it didn't work out. But, ultimately, I think that's the path. Uh, but I, I disagree that he will not get another big time head coaching job in the college scene. I think if he wants it, I think his resume is still pretty strong. I mean, Florida was in the national well, title conversation a year ago. Um, so I, I think he'll be, I think he'll land on his feet depending on where he goes, but I also just, he's still pretty well, young. He's got a great contact in, in the NFL. He's got urban Meyer on the NFL, you know, the NFL teams think so highly of him. So it's solid reference. I mean, he would just be, he's a great offensive mind. And I think ultimately with how much the NFL pulls from the college game now and how uh, synonymous high school, college, and NFL really are uh, these days that I think uh, he'd be a natural freight. I mean, Kellen Morris has been fantastic in Dallas. So um, I don't know. I think Mullen, I, I'm not going to tell a guy what he should or should not do, but I do think uh, the guy will have options. Um, speaking of options, Jeff Brom, 
uh, this week, uh, he said something that was really interesting. Um, do you remember when the Louisville job came open uh, a few years back when Scott Satterfield took it from App State? Um, that has been a rocky uh, relationship to this point. Um, we'll see what happens this fall. There's a lot of optimism in Louisville uh, going into this fall and that this is going to be a bounce back year for Satterfield's team. But Brom obviously coached there, uh, played there, and there's always going to be that pull. Um, Kenny Payne, now the men's basketball coach, pull there, and uh, he goes back to Kentucky, leaves the NBA for that job. But Brom's at a tough spot. He's at Purdue, where he's won a lot. Um, uh, there's an asterisk on what happened in the bowl game this year. Uh, some call it a win. I call it a, a hedge. I call it a uh, we're not going to talk about it type deal. Uh, no one gets a win. No one gets a loss for that particular affair <laughs> uh, in December, but we'll move forward. Um, Jeff Brom on Purdue, though, in Louisville. This is from Football Scoop. They pulled this. He was speaking at some alumni event. I think it was at Louisville. And he said, quote, after being at Purdue two years, when it came open, it was a tough call. That was a tough call. And he's talking about when Louisville came open. To be quite honest, through my schooling and how I was raised, I believe in at least trying to do the right thing and having morals and values. It just was too early to leave. It just wasn't right. You build relationships. People treat you right. The people there have treated me great. You talk to recruits and they ask me things. Just a lot of things went into it. Uh, the story goes on to say that Brom closed his response to the question by leaving the door back to Louisville cracked open, at least for now, it seems. He said, quote, but obviously now we're on year six. I love this town, this area. I'm an aloveness of Louisville, so anything can happen in the future. That kind of caught me off guard, Matt. The reason I threw this in our show sheet, I was like, that's, you don't hear coaches just openly. I understand the alumni factor, but um I don't know. This was uh, a little spicy for me. This was a little spicy, and I don't know if this is to put pressure on Purdue to back the Brinks truck up to keep him there, but I don't know, man. Uh, I, I understand where he's coming from, but it is interesting. What did you make of Brom's comments there? Yeah, it's interesting uh, to say it was too early to leave. I feel like two years does seem too early. Like. Mm. I feel like Mel Tucker leaving after one year. One year is mm-hmm. almost like you're not even there. It was just yeah. like, this is just like a one year thing. Nothing didn't really happen. Like, you guys won't even miss me. Like, everything's cool. I'm going to go find a better job. But two years, it's like, okay, we've been building something and just bounce. You had to respect him, like, turning down. I mean, it's like, what's a better job, right? Purdue or Louisville? Like, oh, that's, it's Louisville, no question. What makes Purdue's- Louisville? But- Louisville has been, I mean, you have the Lamar Jackson of the world. It's a better recruiting area. It's a better, like, you're Outside in the of the ACC. three years Lamar Jackson was there, like, the last 20, 30 years of college football, like, I, I don't think Louisville's anything better than, than Purdue is. I think it's just an easier place to win consistently at. And obviously the alumni aspect, but Purdue's academics is real, man. Their best wideout just got ruled academically ineligible this week. So he's out. The replacement to David Bell is gone for the year. So it's academics at Purdue is a real thing. And Georgia Tech deals with that a little bit. Notre Dame deals with it a lot. Um, it Stanford, there's a Northwestern. You can go up and down the list. Like They're all school. student athletes for sure. Yeah, but it's also just harder to stay. Like It's just a harder school to get into. It's a yeah. harder school to maintain good grades and be a two sport, like be an athlete. Like it's just is Louisville a better job than Kentucky? football yeah yes i mean you're, you're gonna you have a better chance to win something at louisville yes. but I don't like know, I mean, you get that sec money like that's uh that's something serious you know so but like, if you're being de- in the big 10 kind of puts purdue on like a in the big 10 west too like their their chances they get in the conference championship aren't just you know almost impossible like you look at maryland and and Rutgers of the world, like, you're not getting to the conference championship. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just not going to happen. So, and the Big Ten West, it seems a little different. They haven't gotten to it yet. And the the, the last, what, decade or so of, of, of Purdue football hasn't been good. But, like, I feel like before that, I mean, they were a respectable program. Like, Drew Brees, Kyle Orton years. Like, they, they've had a lot of, like, solid teams in there. For sure. I mean, Rondale Moore just came through. I mean, they put out players like that George uh, Karlaftis. Um, he goes in the first round. Like they produce a lot of NFL talent, but I don't know. I, I just 
it's also not home. Like the allure of coaching your alma mater, man. Like I'm sure it's pretty strong, and uh, I don't know. We'll have to see what happens. But I'm, I'm not pretty. Like, yeah, I feel like that would be the only place that what you people wouldn't look at him as a backstab or mm-hmm. anything. Like after year two, which, which he could have done, going to Louisville to the alma mater, like you're going home kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think the fact that he actually had the opportunity to do it, like. It might be a hypothetical thing for a lot of guys. Like, I'm sure Mario Cristobal has thought about the opportunity of getting the Miami job for a long time. Kind of like Mark Richt when he lost the, the Georgia, when he got fired at Georgia. It was like, I, he, he seemed like he was so burnt out he didn't need another head coaching job. But it was like, his alma mater is open up. Like, I got to jump on that now because who knows when that could, could happen again, you know? Mm-hmm. So... Louisville isn't one of those powerhouses. It could be open again in, in a couple of years. It could be open next year. You know, who knows? But uh, it was interesting for him to not rule it out because he did have the opportunity. And you think the longer you're there, the, the more relationships you're building, right? Like the, the more tradition you've, you've built, up, more equity you've built up at Purdue. So I don't know. It's interesting that he didn't, that he didn't shut the door completely. Absolutely. Um, well, let's get into our main event, Matt Green. Uh, FanDuel released a bunch, a bunch of odds, uh, betting odds ahead of the 2022-2023 college football season, which is great because it adds context to uh, where the odds makers and where folks around the world uh, see college football teams at the moment. Like spring practice is done. There's still a lot of battles left to be decided. Um, and position battles like coaching stuff and we'll we'll see injuries are unfortunately a part of this game and we'll see who gets through the summer unscathed but there are it's a lot true. to go alabama through. would have won the national championship if it wasn't for those injuries yeah, yeah i'll give you that um uh, because i am not one of those people that whine about that sort of thing because it's just that's how it works i mean the nba yeah, it's right. just like oh maybe i don't know but it, it happened <laughs> it's, it's, it's done and that's just part of it, though. You can't turn yeah. injuries off. Injury, you play the hand you're dealt, and that is all that needs to be said, and you don't need to uh, throw out any sour grapes there. Um, however, there are a lot of odds. So you and I, we picked our favorite lines, our top five favorite lines, and I don't believe we had any crossover in our favorite lines. So, we did not. Um, I think, as the guest, Matt, you should start with which line – first stood out to you that you liked um to start off i gotta go week one utah Mm. one and a half point dog uh at florida week one like i just think utah is a better team than florida like i feel like they're just like i'm not no no shade at napier or anything but i just think week one like i don't think i don't think florida's ready for utah like i think utah's gonna win that one outright I think it's interesting because I think Florida's first two games are against Utah and Kentucky, right? Oh, I was, I was, I was I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait on that one. Well, I'm saying is that that, it, that isn't one. that their first two games? Am that I is. Yeah, yeah. That's it's a on really, my list. That's a rough way to open the year if you're Billy Napier. If you look at their schedule, I mean, South Florida they just brought in uh, Gary Bohannon, the Baylor quarterback, Jeff Scott, with his biggest portal win since taking over the Bulls job, like. That's not an easy four game stretch because then they go to Knoxville and and face the balls. Like the first four weeks of Napier's uh, season or tenure in Gainesville is just a murderer's row. Like it's it's going to be brutal. Like there's a chance they're one and three after four weeks. Um, but we'll see. I mean, we'll we'll see. We'll see what happens here. But I do think it's unlikely Florida. The reason I brought the Kentucky game is that like that line is interesting to me because. I don't, they're favored by a couple in the Kentucky game. We'll get to that in a second. But Florida is not, I, I would be absolutely floored if they go, they sweep those two games. They go 2-0. and um, yeah. However, I my gut tells me they split them. And I just feel like they're more likely to split with, you like win the Utah game for me and then just be overconfident because they beat this really good Pac-12 team and then lay an egg to a, just a team that loves nothing more than (laughs) beating the Florida Gators because of just how many consecutive losses they had. Um, And it's Utah does feel like the more likely win. Like Mm -hmm. there's just kind of those variables traveling across the country, like that whole thing going to the swamp, like just, Mm -hmm. you know, what what is this? September 3rd, I think is the opening week. Like 
who knows what it's going to feel like in the swamp on September 3rd. Like we could be pushing 100. So that could definitely be a factor, but but yeah, just to just skip right there to my number two because it's on there. Why we've been mm. talking about it is Kentucky. They're a plus four in week two, and I, I like Kentucky in that one too. I was surprised to see Florida favored in both of those games. Yeah, because especially plus four versus Kentucky, like I definitely expect Kentucky to be better than Florida this year. It I is would the agree. swamp, but they won that. They did win in the swamp a couple years ago. So mm-hmm. I uh, well. Man, I that's a huge win, but it also scares me. Like, I don't want Florida to lose to Kentucky at home because I don't want them coming to Knoxville angry. I do not want that being a thing. I don't want them facing zero and two in the SEC East to kick things off here, the Napier tenure. I, I want them to beat Kentucky, feeling good, three and zero. I want them winning the first three, and then I want them to come into Knoxville and uh, lay an egg and come back down to earth a little bit. I but. would be absolutely shocked if if Kentucky, if Florida is three and zero to start Mm -hmm. the season like I just it's not like a murderer's row they're facing or anything I just feel like this this doesn't seem like a team that's just ready to to win now like I feel like LSU might could surprise some people and be like no Ordron was just that bad guys had checked out that much like they seem like they could be more we just know about the talent LSU gets all the time like Florida like the recruiting is why Dan Mullen got fired so like the cupboard if it's not bare, it's it's not full, right? So I just I don't see Florida starting that way. Like even South Florida, like you said, like that was a game for what two quarters last mm-hmm. year. Like if they started zero and three, zero and four of the Napier tenure, like year one, I basically throw out for every head mm-hmm. coach. But oh man, zero and two would be bad. But zero and four, that that's rough. Well, let's throw – I'll I'll do uh, two for me on my side real quick. So yeah. I've got the week zero, which is – I love that Nebraska is embracing week zero football. So this is across the pond. This is in Ireland. Did you know that Northwestern oh, Nebraska – Oh, that's right. Okay. And Nebraska is favored by nine and a half in this one. Like, I'm not – it's too early for our locks of the week. But Nebraska nine and a half covering that spread against the, the Wildcat offense over – in Ireland, just lock it in. Like the Nebraska Cornhuskers kicking things off against that group. Uh, Mark Whipple, his first game is OC. Um, you bring in Casey Thompson. I uh, I think this will be a much more efficient, um, just just a better football team. I'm pretty high on Nebraska coming in this year. We'll see what happens, but I'm I'm buying a lot of a lot of Cornhusker stock right now. I don't now. know if I could go nine and a half for that. Just because that game feels like it's gonna be like thirteen to to six or something. Mm. Like I don't know. You could be right. This could be a different Nebraska offense for sure. It feels like so many of those games that they play overseas just get mm. sloppy. Like I don't know what it, the different grass or you know what they're doing over there. It feels like the the NFL games in in London are always just the field just seems sloppy. Mm. So I wonder. I feel like it seems like Northwestern's game, right? They got the long grass. So I, you know, I wouldn't. Uh, I don't. I don't like. I don't like Nebraska at nine and a half. That's fair. That is fair, Matt Gray. I do like them to win, though. Okay, I'll give you that. Uh, yeah, anyway, your second one. I need to get Northwestern in the top one hundred of offensive efficiency per CFB stats before I'm taking them on a nine and a half point spread. I think that's pretty easy for Nebraska to uh, get that's a two touchdown. Could be lead. ten zip. Yes, a hundred percent, and I could see that. Um, Penn State minus three versus Purdue in week one. So Penn State's on the road here in uh, Purdue country. We talked about them a little bit. Jeff Brom's team's good. They lose, like I said, their best uh, receiving threat uh, to academic ineligibility. I thought there was a lot of fool's gold with this uh, Purdue team. They lost a lot of talent. I think they'll be fine this year. Jeff Brom's too good of a coach. But Penn State is not going to be in a dogfight this early in the season. There's just so much riding on this year. Sean Clifford comes back into the fold. Um, they've got a lot of talent on both sides of the ball. I think they're going to be a top 10 in offense and defense uh, this year. Penn State is going to be on a mission. And, I mean, they've got the Auburn game on the road. That's a big out-of-conference game. But I just I don't think this is going to be a field goal type deal for Penn State, like where they have to kick a late game field goal to to escape from the Boilermakers, I'm going to say they win uh, pretty comfortably. And I, I like that line. If I'm, if I'm jumping on it now, I like Penn state minus three a lot. Yeah. I can feel you on that one. Also, I have to correct myself. Uh-huh. Um, Florida was beating uh, 
South Florida 35 to 3 at halftime last year. Mm. So that was not a game for two quarters. So I, I apologize. That was the Anthony Richardson show last year. So mm. had to uh, had to retract that for the Gator fans listening. We're not I just like ganging it. up on you guys. Well, Matt, where are we going next? Who do you have next on your favorite lines? Oh, who do I have? Um, next, I got A and M minus eight versus Miami at home. I just feel like there's so much buzz around Miami. I, it feels like fool's gold to me. Like I just I wouldn't be surprised early on too in the season. Like A and M's gonna be good this year. I think I don't know who the quarterback's gonna be yet. It in my my gut is Max Johnson, but I don't know. But I just feel like they're gonna be, there's gonna be a quality team in the SEC this year, and I don't, I don't see Miami playing with one of the better teams in the SEC. That's what it comes down to. So I feel like, like last year, like it, maybe this might not be Alabama, just you know, taking them to the woodshed. But I think going into Kyle Field, I don't think Miami's ready for that. I think, uh, I think they win this game by multiple scores. I mean, Cristobal did go into the shoe last year and stun the, the Buckeyes, if I seem to recall correctly. This is true. This is year one, though. Like, how, mm. how good can Miami be year one? I know they're, they're doing a lot of re- recruiting, a lot of NIL stuff going on, but they still seem young. So Tyler Van Dyke, you know, maybe put the team on his back. You know, we'll see. But I, I, I like A&M's chances at home to, to win big. I mean, if the town's close and Van Dyke is who people think he is, and they, there's now some buzz that he can go number one in the draft next year. Like, if Van Dyke's the guy, if he's a Heisman guy, then we'll look at this game completely differently uh, this fall. And I think that's something that we have to see is, like, I want to see Texas A&M sort out their quarterback stuff. I want to see this offense humming. I want to see yeah. them moving in the right direction. Um I don't know. Well, there, A&M's, a, I would stay away from a lot of A&M lines until I see – uh, this group in action on offensively. Like, they got talent everywhere. It's not a question of talent. It's not even a question of coaching. Jimbo's an elite coach. He won a national title. They got an elite staff. But I just, uh, I don't not know. Not a question of talent, not a question of coaching. Sounds like a damn good team to me. For right? sure. Right? It's got to be. be. I, they should be a good team this year, for sure. They should be. Um, One thing that I think sucks for AM and AM fans is the 2020 year is just totally forgotten. Hmm. Like, it's just completely glossed over. Like they went ten and one or eleven and one, however many games they ended up playing in the COVID short mm-hmm. year. Like a one loss season where you're playing only SEC teams, like that's a super impressive year that I feel like just gets kind of swept under the rug. Like no one really pays attention to it. Like they they had a case for being the four seed and making the playoff that year. So like it, it has such a vibe of of kind of how people felt about Georgia. Like I think Georgia was you know, co- collective, like, consistently better than A&M. Like, not going 8-5 and five as much. But A&M is right there, one of the better teams. We all know how low to the SEC West is every year. Like, all the signs are there. Like, they're pointing to this team being one of the elites in college football. And I feel like we kind of forget that they were that two years ago. And you're just like, yeah, but they're going to blow it like they do every year, you know, and they're going to go 8-5. and five. Like, I'm sure I even said that, but... It's uh, we. I think we're a little harsh on A and M sometimes. Like I think they're they have all the signs to be one of the best teams in the country this year. Definitely one of the best teams in the West. And we just have to see it. I mean, they got a tough schedule, but they play in the West. And I just Jimbo and that group, they're in the conversation. They're doing everything right. Where if you're an A and M fan, the program has n- literally never been in better shape ever. Like this yeah. is the best. So just hey embrace it things are good and just hope uh a lot of these close games go your way and the offense figures it out um my number three the cougs plus 14 and a half against wisconsin in week one i like this maybe not for what you expect it's actually because i'd like the cougs to cover that like i 14 and a half with this defense and they promote from within so they didn't have to institute a new scheme i like their oc higher they bring in uh the uh the what was the kid's name? Not Jared Garantana, but uh, their Jaden Delora just went to um, to Arizona, and their core. Like, what is his name? He's the he's a FCS kid, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head. But his FCS highlights are top notch, and you just think about they're still going to run the run and shoot offense, and they're going to be that Mike Leach style, just fun. And if the defense is as good as it was this past year, which is really good. 
I don't know, man. I think uh, the Wisconsin uh, the Wisconsin Badgers, the way they're playing, and we'll have to see what happens. Understand with Graham Mertz, who is a question mark. Graham Mertz, we're still waiting for that to be a fun, consistent thing. I don't know, man. Brandon Allen could run all over the Cougs, and this could be a blowout, and then just uh, a, a, a rough game in uh, Madison. But this has all the makings of a, a cover, like for uh, the Cougs. I think they'll they'll do that do well there. Uh, what do you think? I could see it just because there's always that question with Wisconsin's offense. So, you know, just Cameron the, Ward, the, the, Ward is his name, by the way. I could not think. Okay. Of his name. So, yeah, just the idea of Wisconsin not blowing them out week one, it, like it definitely makes sense. You know, like I think that people get kind of forget Wisconsin because they, they, they kind of wrote them off after the one and three start last year. Mm-hmm. But I mean, they ended up going nine and four, won like eight games in a row or something. So, I think Wisconsin, like the offense started, like they started scoring more points, but Graham Mertz never started doing more in the passing game. They just, I don't know, they just started scoring more points. You're just running the ball, which is uh, is an aspect of offense, regardless of uh, what what people might think. Offense is not only throwing the ball; you do need to run the ball as well. So Wisconsin is usually able to do that. That's their their bread and butter. So if they continue to have a strong running game, maybe Graham Mertz is enough to uh, you know lead a, a good offense. But um, I don't hate the uh, taking taking the Cougs plus fourteen and a half. Cameron Ward won the Jerry Rice Award for like best uh, FCS freshman last year. But if you watch his incarnate, uh, and I know I'm incarnate mispronouncing word. it. Yeah, there uh, his stuff was just preposterous. So this dude's gonna be a lot of strong Kyler vibes uh, when I was watching. Okay. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what kind of numbers he puts up up there in uh, Pullman. Uh, where are we Chase going next? Tom- if we have, can we have an infographic? Chase Thomas, camera reward next. Kyler Murray, right there. Put it, put it on the board. I, I'm just saying, folks. When you see like all the, it's like the oh, where did Gardner Minshew come from? Where did uh, this Washington State quarterback that everybody's all <laughs> yeah. in on? Do you, do you have another one? No, I'm just what Cameron Ward's <laughs> the next one. Like he's just gonna be a baller in Pullman, and people are gonna be like, oh, Pac-12 so. after dark. Yeah, he'll be trending at late at night and you're like why is cam ward trend trending and it's like oh he's he's just uh putting on a show and they're down 35 14 at ucla and cameron ward's still going hard and uh throwing the ball up there and having fun out there that's just uh that's what i think or it's gonna be good hey i'm all for it i'm all for the cougs um i got a soft spot for the cougs back in my ncaa days <laughs> um <laughs> moving on my number four texas mm. minus one against oklahoma in the Red River shootout. I think Texas is a better team than Oklahoma uh, in 2022. And at, at minus one, it's basically a pick em. So I, I like I like Texas to beat Oklahoma this year. They should, man. Uh, if you're going to – it's like the whole Florida – Texas is in that zone with uh, – Tennessee is in with Florida with their rival where it's like, man, if you're not going to do it this year, if you're not going to go over the hump and put it all together with year zero of Brent Venables and – all the roster leaving Mario Williams and Caleb Williams and all these dudes leaving like what, uh, when are you going to do it? When are, when's it going to be? Uh, like, I like that comparison a lot. I feel like that's a really good comparison. So we'll see. I mean, they should, they should be favored by more. My, it might, I'm sure it will go up or down depending on how they, both both teams start, uh, the 2022 season. But I, uh, a lot of pressure on Sark and the Longhorns and you saw the buzz about like Arch is waiting to see improvement uh from the texas longhorns this fall uh before making up his mind on where he's gonna play college football in uh 2023 so i don't know i mean i uh, wonder right if if they show improvement and quinn ewers is that guy then is arch trying to go there i mean granted he's a he could he's a red shirt freshman mm -hmm. right this year so he could leave after after 2023 so Mm -hmm. he might be only sitting for one year but i don't know we'll we'll see i um Texas still feels like uh, definitely one of the players for, for Arch Manning, but we'll, we'll have to see. A lot, a lot, a lot of time before then. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ole Miss minus 10.5 against Georgia Tech in week three. Uh, for the folks that are wondering, so I just I feel bad for Jeff Collins. I really do because <laughs> Georgia Tech had an awful schedule last year, and boy, they have an awful <laughs> schedule this year, and there's just no path to a bowl game. For them there's just no path whatsoever and you just you just feel for yellow jacket country and i um i i, I say this with uh 
the utmost respect. Ten and a half is embarrassing low of a spread for Ole Miss and Jackson Dart and the Lane Kiffin Portal King train that's going to be playing uh, the Yellow Jackets in week three. Zach Evans and company, like they are, they are going to run all over Georgia Tech. They are going to win this game. Like if there's a lock of the week early, it's Ole Miss ten and a half. They are not beating the the Jackets by only ten and a half. It's, I don't know what happened here. Uh, let's get. I would love to have uh, Ad Stansbury on this very program, and I can talk to him about why he scheduled the games that he scheduled the last two years, but. Um, it's just it's brutal i feel like you're looking at the georgia tech schedule right now uh, as i'm going through this are you i am i'm trying to pull it up here look at how bad it is matt like it's rough um yeah i mean they're they're losing Ole miss they're losing mm-hmm. at ucf who else is that con- obviously georgia they're um, out of conferences georgia ucf and Ole miss man and western carolina's in there too but okay but yeah yeah they're not how many wins do you see there <laughs> Man, they're not they're not making a bowl game. No, like they're you're looking at a three or four win team here. I actually I was listening to 680 like on my way to work the other day, and like the way Joe Hamilton talks about Georgia Tech is honestly like sad at this point. He's just like, yeah, what Jeff Collins is doing doesn't even affect me. Like he's like I'm just he's like that uh, he's like that just disconnected from the program. They're just. Like they seem like they're on the on the cusp of losing like power five status. Like it's this is getting ridiculous. And they were at least were always good at foot or at basketball. Like they would get like big time recruits in basketball. Like big time guys here and there, right? Like a Final Four, get Derek Favors, those kind of guys, you know. But now it's like they're terrible at basketball. So like what what are you doing? Like what? How are you justifying still being in a major conference? Like they're just they've gotten so bad. And I just, I don't know how they've gotten this bad. I, I don't know how the line was at 10 and a half for Ole Miss. That's what I'm saying. That's a steal right now if you can get on that one. Um, yeah, I mean, shout out to my guy, Josh Passner. He's one of my favorite coaches I've ever had the pleasure of talking to. He's an absolute pleasure. And uh, look, the Georgia Tech basketball program's in good hands with Coach Passner. But, and you also need to put some respect on the best college baseball stadium in the country at, uh, um, I've seen uh, so many games. With Is that my, the best uh, one? Oh, the skyline of uh, downtown Atlanta and everything. Oh, yeah. The uh, Georgia Tech baseball okay. stadium. If you have not seen Well, the that, best one is definitely App State. For sure. I, I guess I'm talking about the But and they got an unfair advantage. For That's sure. true. Just that, that view in the mountains. I mean, it's not but, just uh, the view in the mountains. They're just, they put the stadium like in a in the mountains. It's like they, they yeah. chopped down the trees around the stadium to like uh, put them in this own little fortress they got going on. But yeah, no, App State, uh, definitely a bucket list site for me but uh danny hall's got the georgia tech yellow jackets they're humming they've been in the top 25 majority of the year um but you know they're they're okay they just <sighs> paul johnson i said it at the time that georgia tech fans were gonna miss paul johnson that was my take and uh i just think to win at a place like georgia tech you have to do you can't try and build like georgia what you have to do is find a niche whether it's air raid option whatever you got to go like you have to be like the Washington State Cougars, Texas Tech. You've got to think outside the box and you have to run a different kind of operation. Um, and it's just unfortunately not going to work there. But I would be yeah, interested. Like you thought being good once every six years was bad. Yes. Just, just wait, wait and see what, uh, what Jeff Collins has got for you. Right. I mean, just pluck. I mean, I would if I was I mean, there's just a lot of different ways I can go. We'll see what happens. I don't want to uh talk about next coach uh while jeff collins is still uh still there so we'll see uh maybe he proves us all wrong we, it's a possibility maybe jeff sims is the guy and uh things are awesome but losing jameer gibbs is a it's a brutal blow there not a great start um, um while we're bashing this georgia tech yellow jackets <laughs> let me go to my number five which mm-hmm. is georgia is a 28 point favorite over georgia tech in 2022 I think Georgia could basically just pick their score in this game. What was it, 45 to zero last year? Like, in Georgia Tech last year, right? Or was it? What's the line where you would be like, I don't know about this? Where do you think you would be? What would the number be before you're concerned about, like, losing money on this game? I think 35. 35 is pushing it. Okay. You know, like, it's. eh, But I would probably still take it, you know, because I think. It's just it's Georgia Tech. Like mm. I, I 
Yeah, enough said. It didn't used to be like this. Paul Johnson was in these games. Like, this was not a guarantee. You never – Georgia knew that it was going to be a pain in the butt to play this team last week of the year, get up for this Paul Johnson annoying offense, and you never – like, it just – It was basically like like every Georgia team that Mark Richt ever had that was good smashed Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. Like, and it was like when Georgia Tech was good and Georgia was bad – and then we got a good game on our hands, mm-hmm. right? And but it's those kind of like solid to good teams that were kind of like you didn't know what to expect. Those kind of nine, ten win teams, those mm-hmm. would be the teams that could lose to Georgia Tech, right? Like those those would be the ones that kind of overlook them or whatever the case may be. They're just a scrappy triple option team, maybe an undisciplined team that didn't tackle well or something, or just didn't play their didn't play the part of the option like uh, the way they're supposed to. Things like that. But it's like every year you go to like 2002, like 2007, 2012, like all those like really good Mark Rick teams, they just smashed Georgia Tech. Like it wouldn't, it wouldn't even be close. And that's why I think 2009 is honestly like my favorite game, the, the Caleb King, Washon Ely, we run this state game, because that was actually, although 06 Stafford's freshman year is, is up there too, because those are games where Georgia Tech was like top 10 and Georgia was like basically just bad, like seven, eight win teams, and they would still beat Georgia Tech because that's just how that's the different level that they're on, right? But but right now, where Georgia Tech is and where Georgia is, like you finally see in the last couple years, or I should say last year, because in 2020, Georgia, 2019, Georgia kind of did play around, didn't put a lot of teams away, but you you finally saw a lot last year of like like a lot of the elite teams in college football, like the Alabamas, the Ohio States do, the Oklahomas do. Like when they're playing an inferior opponent, they make the scoreline look like they're playing an inferior opponent. And I think that's what you've seen Georgia kind of turn the page. Like they seem like a truly elite program now. And when you place a team like Georgia Tech, like, yeah, they're they're winning by four or five touchdowns easy. Like I, it's not going to be close, especially not at it. home. I just don't see it changing anytime soon. I don't see there being a path back to this rivalry being respectable and what Kirby has at Georgia right now. I just don't see a path anytime soon. It's just, Especially you got Georgia com- repping Atlanta harder than Georgia Tech is. It's like that's all Georgia Tech had going for them was the city of Atlanta. I, um, It can't help that NIL especially, and I'm very pro NIL and this, that, and the other, but when you read the Ivan Maisel piece about that everyone should go check out an on three today, um, one of the things just um, that he quoted one of the guys in there about like, don't even ask about the education aspect of it. It's just you're wasting your time if you're uh, pitching to these kids like what uh, kind of debris, degree program they could be on, what kind of track at this X school. And it's like that was like one of the things that would intrigue an Andrew Luck to a Stanford or a player uh, to Georgia Tech was just that like, hey, we can offer you this kind of elite education and you can also get a full ride scholarship to play football here. Um, Here's this awesome thing. But now that's even been taken away where it's like how many kids want to deal with the, the grind of a Georgia Tech academic calendar while also playing football where there's no path to uh a winning culture anytime soon it's just it's a rough situation i think uh on the flats and i don't know it it just kind of bums me out that the rivalry is this lopsided and i don't see a path out of it anytime soon for sure like i don't i just don't know like i don't even know where this program goes because i felt like i'll be honest like it's one of my worst sports takes right i'll own it like i thought jeff collins was going to be the guy to bring georgia tech back to relevance Mm -hmm. like I thought the next team that, that would win the ACC, not named Clemson. Granted, I was thinking Clemson would have at least like 2024, 2025. Jeff, give Jeff Collins some time to build up a, a competitive team there. But the way he was he was kind of selling the city of Atlanta, that's mm. that's what I've always said Georgia Tech should be doing. And kind of if you could get these, like the third, like we saw the state of Georgia just had more players than California drafted in this most recent draft. Like... That's insane what, what Georgia's producing at the high school level. And you saw like Steve Spurrier's South Carolina teams, like the the Kentucky teams of like those mid 2000s, like they were built on that, that fourth tier talent coming out of the mm-hmm. state of Georgia. Like so many teams, even Vanderbilt under like James Franklin would get a lot of those guys that didn't have offers from Georgia that were just were good players. And now you're seeing like, 
even teams smaller than Georgia Tech come in and get some of that talent before Georgia Tech's getting it. Like you're seeing Central Florida come out and get mm. some before Georgia Tech's getting it. So I felt like even even someone like Auburn, like they're getting a, a level higher than South Carolina and Florida was, but like they, they would get guys that don't have Georgia offers. Like there's so much talent to go around in the state of Georgia. I would just think, especially the, especially that Metro Atlanta area, you would just think Georgia Tech, you could just throw a rock at a couple four-star prospects a year and just get them on, on campus. So like, I don't know. It seems like they could get five to 10 of the top, like 40 players in the top 50 players in the state and, and, and start to do something, but they're not even doing that right now. So like, I don't know. I, I don't see any future where Georgia tech is, is getting better. I don't either, man. I uh, I don't either. This, this is sad. Um, I don't even know how to end on my, my version here uh <laughs> virginia tech plus two and a half uh against the west virginia mountaineers in week three i love this for virginia tech um mountaineers this is man. uh in blacksburg right uh i think it's uh no i think it's in uh morgantown unless i'm misremembering it did i look at it wrong Let me that see. actually helps me i got virginia tech yeah it's at home it's okay. at, in blacksburg that's what i thought okay originally yes um which i love Blacksburg, different kind of environment. Um, would love for Tennessee to schedule uh, some consecutive home and homes there. That would be nice. Um, but look, Brent Pry, I think, is more of a culture fit than Justin Fuente. I think Justin Fuente, I think people are discounting just how good he was out the gate uh, in uh, in Blacksburg. He won. It obviously didn't end well there, but he's still a good coach, and I'm curious to see what happens with him going forward. But um, Brent Pry, longtime DC over there in Happy Valley uh, with Penn State. He was elite this past year, uh, coaching the Penn State and Nittany Lions defense. Like he's co-defensive coordinator there, but been there a long time, uh, longtime Franklin guy. I think the culture and the buy-in is going to be immediate there. I think there is going to be uh, just a lot of optimism, and I think Virginia Tech will turn some heads a little bit. Uh, pretty early on there and i i just like them at home i think uh graham harrell and jt daniels uh air raid that they're going to try and throw at brent pry i don't think it's going to work i i like uh, the Hokies early there that that app that that's an appetizing line to me a rivalry game that kind of thing I, I like the Hokies and blacksburg in this scenario i'll be honest i looked at this game and i was uh i almost picked west virginia but mm-hmm. um, the the Lane Stadium factor that, yep. that that kept me against it. But yeah, two and a half point home dog. I um I can never a home dog always seems like a good idea. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, especially one like that in a rivalry situation. Uh, but Green? watch out for JT Daniels, man. West Virginia's Mountaineers are a sleeper next year if he can stay healthy. We'll see, man. It's a big I... if. We'll see. I think I'm just excited for the backyard brawl. JT versus Keaton Slovis, the USC battle uh, for those two. I think that's going to be a, a fun game that you have to have circled. Um, I don't know. It's There's so many good games. When we looked at the calendar, uh, the Fox broadcast calendar, ESPN, and just all the big games and how they're scheduling it out, I, uh, I just this is going to be a pretty electric time. I was fired up, and I was like, oh, good yeah, stuff. we still got Yeah, see that um... – Georgia, Oregon, three thirty, mm-hmm. and then Notre Dame, uh, Ohio State, seven thirty. That first week, that's that's going to be a, a nice little schedule. I'm curious to see what the noon game is that day. But yeah, you, you've seen. I guess you've seen Texas fans, right? Mm-hmm. Signing the petition to get their <laughs> game moved from noon, which is at eleven a.m. local kickoff for mm-hmm. Alabama. Like, I'm torn on this to be honest. Like, part of me wants to just troll Texas fans and like, you guys are just the worst. So, like, you just you got like the TV announcement of like your your big time game for the season, and you're signing a petition to get the game changed. But 11 a.m. local kickoff that's so early. Like, I don't know. I I can kind of sympathize with them a little bit after watching a few of the noon game days uh like game days being at noon kickoffs like they did i think it was like back to back um oklahoma texas and then georgia arkansas i was really digging like college game day being like in the stadium like right as like ending as kickoffs about to happen like i thought it was like a cool although i don't know if they could even do that right if it's a fox game day Mm. might not even be in there might they might have uh their the 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 what am I trying to say priority there 
Yeah. Like Brady, Brady Quinn, Reggie Bush, you know, they're not, they're mm. not letting you on their turf, you know, Urban Meyer, he was not going to stand for that. So I don't know. I'm curious, but I really liked when the, uh, how they did that in a few of those, those game days, like went right into the game. Like, it's like, this is what we've been watching for the last three hours, right? On game day. Like, let's, let's watch this game now. Let's not wait eight hours uh, to watch it later. I also just think it's silly because um, the, that's the best game coverage you'll get in college football now clat and gus that big noon fox game is top notch year over year like that's a great spot to, for you to be in. i understand the 11 a.m like you laid out but man if i'm a fan and i'm not there give me the nooner give me the oh, big nooner it's the best game it's the as best a broadcast. neutral fan i'm all about it like mm-hmm. game day ends and now we have a good game to watch yes. right now we don't have to sit through you know <laughs> northwestern michigan state or something mm-hmm. right like we we just get right into the good stuff. So I'm all for it as a fan, uh, watching on TV. But oh man, what time are you waking up? Like that's that's such a big deal for Alabama to be there in Texas. Like just the atmosphere. I feel like you do kind of lose something. Like with the Red River Shootout, like you know that's going to be at noon every year, right? So you're mm. just you plan your day. You probably have your yearly ritual of how you set up, how you get ready for that rivalry. But something that's special about this one, it feels like you're getting robbed a little bit of like that, just that energy around like the town. Like I Mm. I know I was living in Athens when Georgia had the blackout against Alabama. Obviously the game didn't go how um, Georgia fans wanted it. But there was just like an energy in downtown Athens that day that it was just like national game of the week, game day's here. Like there's just, it was just an electric atmosphere and you you had an eight o'clock game. It was just all day for that to build up. I don't mm-hmm. like waiting till eight o'clock, 3.30 is like the perfect, you know, the for time slot in my opinion. But uh, mm. but yeah, I so I can kind of sympathize with them a little bit, but it's it's gonna be awesome to get to get the college football day started off. That's week two. So I don't know what, uh, what the other big time games are week two off the top of my head, but um mm-hmm. I'm I'm jacked about it, as Dan Quinn would say. There you go. There you go. Matt Green, we can find you on Twitter at Matt underscore W underscore Green. And uh, all of his great college football takes and analysis, go ahead and give him a follow there. And uh, we do this every week at this time. Glad to be back, and I'm glad school is uh, off my plate for the summer. So that's good. That is good. Uh, School's out for summer? Is it out forever? No, I graduate this fall. Yeah. Okay. One more semester. Almost there. Almost there. Almost there. You just yeah. don't want to graduate college. I got you, man. You just want to be in college forever. You're not, you're not fooling anybody. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I do love, <laughs> I mean, I love being on campus. I mean, there was someone I will mention and one on this. Uh, I was getting into the elevator. I was telling the fiance about this, um, which doesn't get old. The whole fiance thing. I like, I like the upgrade from girlfriend to fiance. <laughs> I, I like that sound. Um, but, uh, I was on campus studying, uh, late one night and I, went to get on the elevator and i'm 31 that and these kids 19 20 uh, <laughs> they get on the elevator too and one uh, just there was a lot of capital b bro energy going on with the, the three of them and uh one of them turned to the other and was like bro do you ever just put on uh beethoven when you're studying it's clutch and i <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard about this guy, yeah. Beethoven? You don't even know about that. <laughs> let, let, let me show you this. That's funny. It was uh, it was a lot where I was just, uh, man, I'm too old for this. I, I need to go ahead and get my master's and get out of here because it's just the kids and I, there's disconnect. We have nothing in common anymore. <laughs> we have nothing in common. Um, but there you go. Matt Green, always That's a pleasure. Awesome. And I will talk to you next week.